do you think of when I uh, think of a priest? What kind of clothes do you reckon they would wear? What comes to mind? Dandro. <laughs> Dandro. Or Dandro black jacket? <laughs> Maybe the dog collar? Is that the school? There's probably uh, some truth uh, in the expression clothes make a man. Uh, if you think of a police officer, a fireman, a soldier, or even a cricket player, you picture a certain uniform. And when you think of a priest, you'll probably think of a long black robe with vestments and a stiff white collar. Hmm. But that's not what the Jewish Christians pictured when they heard the word priest. They pictured a man dressed in white linen robe with a robe of uh, deep blue over it. They would picture the high priest entering the Holy of Holies in the temple. Only the high priest was allowed to pass through the curtain and make sacrifices for the sins of the nation on the Day of Atonement. You heard how specific it all had to be uh, during the Leviticus reading. If it wasn't done right, or if somebody interrupted, somebody walked in, he did something in the wrong order, had to start again. And he could only do it that one day. So the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is now the only one that we can actually call a high priest. So why is Jesus the great high priest? Well, I'm going to give you five reasons. The first one being, he's a sympathetic priest. In uh, chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. The Jewish people wanted to have a sympathetic priest, but they didn't always get it. In fact, the high priest in Jesus' day was an embarrassment. Hmm. Annas had been the high priest, but the position had devolved to his son-in-law, Caiaphas. And we know that uh, Caiaphas um, didn't really do all that good of a job because he was involved in plotting Jesus' death. But then Annas was the greatest either. He got his power by compromising with Rome. He got his wealth by turning the temple into a shopping mall. The same one that Jesus decided to walk in and tell everyone off for. The point is that neither Anas nor Caiaphas had any sympathy for the people. All they really cared about was their own power and wealth. A bit of a contrast to Jesus. He put aside the power and the wealth of heaven to come live on earth as a human. In Hebrews chapter 5, 1 to 4, it describes the qualities of the new high priest. Verse 2, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. Think about how we tend to react when some ignorant person does something wrong. It's very common to get angry with them, or if we don't get angry, we often just don't care at all, and we're completely apathetic. But Jesus, our true high priest, is not indifferent. There are no moral lapses, neither is he harsh. He's able to take the position only because he shares himself in the same weaknesses as a sinner on whom he has compassion. Secondly, he's actually appointed the priest. In verse 4 of chapter 5, it says, No one takes this honour upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, this may not seem much, but Hebrews is called Hebrews because it was written to the Hebrews. And all Hebrews knew that no one could claim to be priest unless they were duly appointed descendants of Aaron. Anyone who attempted to be some kind of self-appointed high priest was going to be in serious trouble. And the Hebrew Christians were familiar with Old Testament examples of people who tried to take over priestly authority. And every one of them had a bad end. In Numbers chapter 16, uh, there were 250 princes 
of Korah's family who decided they had the right to be prophets and priests, just like Moses and Aaron. The earth opened up and swallowed them. Or like Aaron's wicked sons, they took it uh, upon themselves to offer sacrifices in their own way. When they offered unauthorized uh, fire sacrifices, they ended up being consumed and authorized the fire from God. Leviticus 10. The Hebrews knew that the high priest had to be appointed by God. Why? Because God said so. Hebrews 5 told them. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Thirdly, he's an eternal priest. Again, because God said so. In verse 6, it tells us he will be our priest forever. He says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And we'll hear more about Melchizedek later in chapter 7 of Hebrews. But for now, let's uh, leave it that Melchizedek was the prince of, uh, and the priest of Salem. And uh, he was a bit of a mysterious side because no one knew where he came from or where he ended. And there's no record of his death. In the same way, Jesus will be a priest forever because he will have no end. In fact, Jesus is the one constant in a life full of changes. These days, it is unusual to have student ministers stay with congregations for very long. Since being at college, uh, this is my second church. So, so since I've started college, I would say this is my third college. And each time I've uh, had to get to know people, break into cliques, uh, get comfortable being able to chat with people, get to know people, and then after two years, when I can comfortably say, this is my church, this is my home church, this is my church family, I have to say bye and move on. And quite often the same happens with ministers. They move on. I mean, Rob's been here seven and a half. Dan's been here, what, four years? I don't see either of them staying here until they retire. It's just not the norm. But the truth is that just about everybody has trouble with change. And we have to realise that in this life, there is no guarantee that anyone will be with you forever. The time comes when we have to say goodbye to close friends, to pastors or youth ministers, to teachers and mentors, to co-workers, schoolmates and church members. But Jesus is with us forever, from birth to death and beyond. Just before his death, Jesus made this vow in John chapter 14 verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He is our eternal high priest. Jesus will never leave us. Fourth reason is that he's an obedient priest. In chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, it says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. It's uh, easy to see that these were uh, talking about Jesus' agony during the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is an extreme example of one person, one man, who learned obedience from what he suffered. And if you think about it, obedience is harder than when you are already suffering. And the temptation to disobey is even greater than when obedience will only bring us more pain. Say it again. I drew it several times so it makes sense. Obedience is never harder than we are, we are already suffering. And the temptation to disobey is never greater than when obedience will only bring us more pain. That's the situation Jesus faced. He was in the garden and he prayed, 
if it was possible, let this cup pass from me. But your will be done. Never make the mistake of thinking that Jesus did not want to obey. He was determined to obey his Father. But it's one thing to decide to obey and quit. And another to physically walk into torture and death. Jesus was not only willing to obey, he obeyed all the way to the cross. Lastly, he's the perfect priest. In verse 9 it goes on to explain, And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. When it says Jesus was made perfect, this doesn't mean Jesus had any character flaws that needed to be fixed. He lived a perfect life. And he's a perfect priest. Jesus was perfect before he ever came to earth. Life on earth did not make him perfect. It didn't make him any more better because he decided to submit himself to the authorities. The way made perfect is used here is not like talking about a perfected character. It refers to Jesus being perfected in completion of his supreme task. That when Jesus offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, he completed God's plan of salvation. In the readings of Leviticus 16, it was very specific about what had to be done, how many animals had to be offered up. They actually used to tie a rope to the priest when he went in. If he did it wrong, or if he wasn't really a priest, he'd die. And anyone who went in after him would die as well. And so if nothing happened for a while, they'd tug on the rope. And then there was the guy who had to take the scapegoat out. He was sent out with his goat after the priest had laid hands on it and cast all the rest of the sin into his goat, sent it out into the desert because they wanted to be far away from their sin as possible. Even he had his duties of when he came back. He had to uh, bathe and uh, change his clothes. And it's all very specific. It's all very repetitive. Slice this animal, they have to sprinkle his blood on here seven times, here seven times. Next animal, seven times again. How many of us could actually, you think, be bothered going every year on the same day with four animals to give to the praise? <coughs> Hebrews shows us that Jesus is our duly appointed, sympathetic, obedient, eternal, and perfect High Priest. And what does that mean for us now? In verse 16 of chapter 4 it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. 